in the book of Colossians chapter 2 this morning, and notice with me reading one verse just to begin the message, and that's in verse 8. We're going to read a few other verses in the chapter, but we'll begin with verse 8. And the title of our message this morning is Yoga, and I know that nobody's practicing this, but uh, I feel led to preach on it over the years. We've mentioned it in sermons, and uh, I just feel led uh, to preach on this. I don't want to preach on it, don't like to preach on it, because I don't like to give as many quotes in a sermon as I give a scripture, and I don't like to spend 30 hours of research to make sure I'm right on things and then can only spend an hour presenting it. And, uh, and so, but I do have uh, several quotes I'll give to you this morning. Notice with me as we come in reading in verse um, 8, just to begin our message, we find here he said, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Heavenly Father, we do come before Thee this morning. Lord, we ask that Thy will to be done in the service today. We ask, Lord, that Thou would speak to our hearts. We ask, Lord, that Thy blessings and anointing would be upon the reading of Scripture. And Father, again, we just pray that You'll help as we consider this subject and maybe we can help others with this. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen, and you may be seated. As we come to the subject of yoga, uh, I told someone recently, I said, and I told uh, Brother Ernie this morning, I said, I was influenced uh, by yoga as a young person. I said, I used to watch Yogi Bear and Boo Boo. And uh, so I'm just kidding. But anyway, I did watch that. Uh, and uh, but we live in a country uh, whereby that this is this uh, is uh, a subject that is growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, as Christians, our only authority is the Word of God, and that's the way it's going to be this morning as we preach. And there is no such thing as Christian yoga that we hear about in America today. Uh, and what about those yogi pants? If we have time, we'll say something about that, uh, those yoga pants a little bit uh, in the sermon. Now, in America, and I want to give you just an introduction here, in America, this has become very trendy and very popular, and about 10% of the population is practicing yoga. That's about 30 uh, million people, and it's a $30 million industry. Uh, it, it, it is amazing at how fast that it is growing, not only in the world, but in America. It's probably the fastest growing cult uh, in the world at this present time. Eighty percent of its practitioners are women. In the 1980s, it became very popular as a physical uh, exercise in Western world, especially in America. But back long before that, it was introduced into our country uh, back in the 1960s. Uh, we had the drug cultural generation, and they were experimenting with the psychedelic drugs, different types of uh, music, Eastern religions, and mysticism uh, as an expansion of consciousness. In other words, uh, we find that there was a lot of experimentation back then. And even uh, with the... Uh, Rock and roll groups like the Beatles and others, they influenced America tremendously. And they helped also introduce uh, yoga and Hinduism and uh, Buddhism. Uh, they helped uh, bring some of that into our country as well. As a matter of fact, uh, George Harrison, uh, of the, that was a part of the Beatles, uh, he wrote a song uh, titled, My Sweet Lord. I've heard of this being sung in churches, and that's hard to believe. But uh, in this song, uh, some of the lyrics uh, are like this in reference to Hindu gods. I really want to see you. I really want to be with you. I really uh, want to see you, Lord, but it takes so long. Uh, 
and toward the end of the song, and, and, and throughout the song, it says many times, My sweet Lord, hallelujah. My Lord, hallelujah. My Lord, my sweet Lord, hallelujah. And toward the end of it, we find that it says, My sweet Lord, Krishna, Krishna, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, uh, my Lord, hallelujah, my Lord, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, and and uh, Guru Brahma, Guru, Guru, Guru uh, Vishnu, and several other names here that is in that song that most people don't even know that's in it. And if you ever heard it, and I hope you haven't, but if you ever heard it, you get toward the end of that song, and again, he's singing along, My sweet Lord, and using the word hallelujah, but when you get toward the end of it, you see that he's speaking of Krishna and other Hindu gods or gurus. Well, notice as we come here to our text this morning, as I said, this is very popular in America. That's where we live and that's what we're concerned with was our country. It is also popular globally. Uh, I don't really have to get into that. Even in Israel, uh, yoga is taught in kindergarten and uh, it's used in the is- Israel Defense Forces. Uh, yoga unites, one author said, that yoga unites Hinduism and Kabbalah in which both focus on enlightenment and spiritual power apart from God Almighty. But notice as we come here to our text, and I'm going to back up and read a few verses before we come back to verse 8. But notice with me that in verse, well, verse 3, three will be uh, sufficient. But notice in verse uh, 3, uh, we find here that in speaking of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So as far as the Christian is concerned, we know that all spiritual knowledge is given to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice now as we come down to verse 6, and I want you to keep in mind as well is that yoga is in schools, it's in businesses, It's in YMCA's and it's in many churches today. Again, uh, there's uh, there's organizations and people are calling uh, it holy holy yoga, uh, Yahweh uh, yoga. Uh, It's in many churches and many Christians are saying that there's no harm uh, in uh, practicing yoga. Well, notice in verse six, we find here in verse six. That he says, and as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you're complete in Him, which is the head of all principalities and power. So as we come here looking at verse 8, he begins with a warning. He said, beware. In other words, take warning to what's being said. And he said, lest any man spoil you, that is to rob you or carry you away or take you captive, spiritually speaking. And then he says in verse 8, he said, through philosophy. Philosophy is a love of wisdom. That is the wisdom of this world. Human wisdom or humanism. And uh, throughout history, man has been fascinated with this type of wisdom. And then he uses the words vain deceit. That is empty deception. In other words, it's like a baited hook, the fish does not get what he really bargained for. And then he uses the word, the tradition of men. This is the source of philosophy. And one writer said, the study of philosophy reveals that almost all philosophers build uh, one upon another. And so you're just getting the same recycled philosophy because they build upon one another. Nothing comes from God. And then he says here, and the rudiments of the world, and he says, and not after Christ. 
So the test of any doctrine, any movement, any program, any books, any institutions is to be tested based upon the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice he also says in verse 9, For in him, that's Christ, dwelleth, notice, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Notice, absolute deity in the Lord Jesus Christ. For in Him dwelleth the fullness, not partial, but the fullness that constitutes divinity and a sovereign God. And then notice also in verse 10 that He says, In whom, that is in Christ, I'm sorry, let me back up, I'm reading verse 11. Verse 10, And you are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. And so we see here that, that we are complete in Christ. Uh, Christ has deity. He is God manifest in the flesh. And so we have a warning here, lest we would be robbed or spoiled uh, through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Turn with me, please, to Genesis, just by way of, like I say, introduction in Genesis, this time in chapter 3. And notice with me as I read in verse 5. Genesis chapter 3, and I'm going to be reading in verse 5. And he says here in verse 5, he said, For God doeth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be, be as gods, knowing good and evil. We find here, as a, as a writer uh, said, and I'm quoting from him, he says, man was tempted to have intelligence, and from that day forward, he's been a fool professing himself to be wise. And that was taken out of Romans chapter 1, the text. So we find here this quest for knowledge, that is apart from God. I want you to notice as we read from verse 1. Now we're going to get into our outline that I have on the board that you have also in your hand. And uh, looking at yoga, I want to spend a little bit of time on the meaning. And then number two, the danger. And number three, the Christian and yoga. I think that needs to be addressed, especially in America. It may not need to be addressed as much in India, or some other places, but especially in America. Now, when we talk about the meaning of yoga, and again, I probably have 200 quotes. I may use 20 or so uh, this morning. And when we talk about the meaning of yoga, we don't need to get out here on the street and ask some silly, compromised Christian. We need to go to the source. We need to go to Hinduism. Uh, we need to go to the gurus, the masters, the yogis. We need to go to them and ask them uh, what yoga is all about because that's where it originated at. And there's mystery uh, around where it really began, but it has been around for hundreds of years, evidently. And so when we consider yoga, it is, it is more than just a system of physical exercise for health or a mental uh, technique to promote relaxation or being able to deal with stress and anxiety. It is much, much more than that. Now here's the meaning, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you, when I, I'm gonna give some quotes. Some of these quotes are from Christians, but most of these quotes are gonna be from, uh, 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 yoga, uh, gurus or yogis, or masters. And that's what I did when I preached on martial arts. I gave you the scripture, and then I went and gave you the quotes of those who uh, invented and teach martial arts. And so we'll do the same thing when we look at uh, yoga and its connection to uh, Hinduism. But here is the meaning of yoga. It basically, I'm going to give you a short definition and a longer definition. Basically, yoga means union or to yoke. In other words, like yoking a, or harnessing a horse to a plow or a cow to a plow. It's yoking two things together. And so, 
the meaning of yoga is union or to yoke, and it refers to the union of ourselves with the divine, that is the human spirit, uh, with the spirit of the universe. The design of yoga is to yoke inner divinity with universal divinity, the object with the subject, the worshiper with God, Brahma, that is their God, and it's to yoke the gods of Hinduism as it is practiced in the Hindu religion. Now, if you get out here and ask uh, somebody uh, in America, what does yoga mean to you? Most of them will say, well, it has to do with physical exercise, mental techniques to help me to deal uh, with anxiety and to deal with depression or things of that nature. There would be some that would count it as a religious experience uh, coupled with the physical uh, aspect of it. But when we go to the source and where yoga came from, when we go back to India and places like that, uh, we find that it was never really ever a physical exercise. It all centered around spirituality and a religious connotation to it connecting an individual with the universe and with the divinity that is without and the divinity that they believe that is within. Now, there is nothing wrong with exercise. We all need exercise. But we don't need the exercise of yoga. There's plenty of ways to exercise. You don't even need a program if you've got walking around in a wood sense. Uh, you'll know how to exercise. But uh, so no one needs to be uh, uh, doing the yoga, and especially Christians. I'm going to give you some other quotes here. Here's another quote, and it says, According to tradition, yoga means union, the union of the finite, that is transitory self, with the infinite, that is Brahman, eternal self, Brahman, a term for the Hindu concept of God or ultimate reality, it is the personal divine substance that pervades, envelops, and underlines everything. And so the design is to dissolve the, the distinction between the creator and the creation. It is to awaken the divine within us and connect us to the divine that is in the universe. It is to... Uh, be, it, it's to become the master of yourselves. And this same philosophy is taught in martial arts. It is an ancient path to spiritual growth and union. It is to achieve God's status. It is meant to shape life. It connects us, again, to the inner life. And when we study things like uh, martial arts, yoga, things of that nature... There is great emphasis that is placed upon self and what has taken place within you. Now notice as we come back here, and I am, I am reading um, here in Romans, or not Romans, but uh, I'm going to Romans in a moment, but in Genesis, uh, you'll find that if you begin reading in verse 1, the serpent came into the garden and deceived our first parents and cause them to partake of the fruit. And you notice here's what we find in this passage. It says in verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not, you, you shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, now, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave unto her husband, and with her, and he did eat. Now, notice verse 7, And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. Now, you'll notice with me that in verse 5, again, we find that the serpent, and I'm going to talk about the serpent a little bit more in just a moment, but uh, yoga is serpent worship, the bottom line. It is totally occultic and satanic. Now, I realize if you walked into a gym 
uh, all you would see is a bunch of half-naked people in stretch uh, pants and so forth and, you know, doing exercise. And many do know what it's about and many do not know what it's about, but it is very satanic and it's very wicked and it's contrary to biblical Christianity. But here's what we find in Genesis 3. We find a quest here uh, to have knowledge apart from the living God and to actually to become uh, your own gods. In verse 5 again, he says, For God himself, um, let me start off, For God doeth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And then in verse 7, their eyes are open. So there's this hunger and desire and fascination with humanity to have this spiritual experience or have this intellect and to have this knowledge that is apart from God Himself. Now, turn with me to the book of Romans and notice with me in Romans in chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1. But keep in mind the yoke of yoga is is to connect an individual with the gods of Hinduism. Now notice with me as we come to Romans chapter 1, and I want to read just a few verses here. If I stumble a little bit this morning, I'm capable of doing that any time, but I will do it more when I've got notes all over the pulpit here looking, and I just misquoted a, a verse there looking while I'm reading, thinking I can quote it, and uh, But I've got uh, notes on both sides of the pulpit, and these are quotes, and I'm going to use some of them this morning, some of them I will not. But uh, So bear with me as we uh, go through this. I think it will be worthwhile. Now, here's some more definitions. This is a Webster's Dictionary on yoga, and it says, A Hindu theistic philosophy teaching the suppression of all activity of body, mind, and will in order that the self may realize uh, its distinction from them and attain liberation. Uh, some other quotes, and these are quotes from actually gurus, yogi guru, gurus, or um, yogis themselves, masters. And, uh, and half of these are Indian names. I can't even pronounce them, so I'm just going to give you the quotes. And here's one. Uh, and it says, no one and nothing outside you can give you salvation. Now think about these words. No one and nothing outside of yourselves can give you salvation. You and I know that that's the only place we can find salvation is in Jesus Christ and God Himself. So this quote is, no one and nothing outside yourself can give you salvation or free you from the misery. You have to light your own lamp. You have to know uh, the miniature universe that you yourselves are. What we're going to see is this emphasis placed upon self. When you and I read the Word of God, the emphasis is placed upon God. We are to worship God. The emphasis is not placed upon us. It's placed upon Jesus Christ and the, uh, the Holy Spirit and the Father. Here's another quote. Again, uh, I, I, I'm not even going to try to spell them. I, I, just, I just struggle with these particular names. And here's another quote. Let each man take the path according to his capacity, understanding, understanding and temperament. His true guru will meet him along uh, uh, the path. Another one. Very well known. His last name is spelled L-Y-E-N-G-A-R. And he says, It is through the alignment of the body that I discovered the alignment of my mind, self, and intelligence. And he says, Breath is the king of the, uh, of the mind. He also says that yoga, an ancient but perfect science, deals with the evolution of humanity. This evolution includes all aspects of of one's beings from body, bodily health to self-realization. Yogi means union, the union of the body with consciousness and consciousness with the soul. 
Yoga cultivates the ways of maintaining a balanced attitude in day-to-day -day life and endows skills in performance of one's actions. He goes on to say that yoga is light, which once lit will never dim. The better you, the, the better you practice, the brighter the flame. Another uh, guru, another yogi, a master, uh, he says yoga exists in the world because everything is linked. Uh, another one says karma yoga is a supreme secret in, uh, indeed. Uh, another one says when the breath wanders, the mind also is unsteady. But when the breath is calm, the mind to will be still, and the yogi achieves long life. Therefore, one should learn to control the breath. Another one says beyond meditation, there is the experience of now. And then another one says meditation is a way for nourishing and blossoming the divinity within you. So they speak a lot about the spirit and divinity of the universe and the spirit and the divinity that is within us. Now here are some yogis or gurus or masters uh, associated with yoga. And, uh, and, and, and here's what they think of Christ. One said... Uh, what is Christ? Uh, Simon, the new theologian, wrote, I move my hand and Christ moves. Who is my hand? This, now, this is what they think of Christ. Self-realization fellowship. This is the name of it. Can't pronounce the guy's name. He said, in Christian scripture, it, Christ, is called the only begotten Son. It is the universal consciousness, oneness with God, manifested by Jesus, Krishna, and other avatars. Another quote by another source says, To say that Christ is Savior and the only way to salvation is a mistake. He laughs when his followers say he is the only Savior. Another source says, Man uh, reincarnates on earth until he has consciously regained his status as a son of God. And one more says, remember that Christ is not a person, it's an experience, Christhood, like uh, Buddha, it is an experience. And I got many other of these quotes, I'm only giving you a few of them. And so I'm simply saying to you, is that when you really look into the roots of yoga, the connection with Hinduism that's been around many, many years, you'll find that there is nothing Christian that it uh, disregards, disregards rather, the Jesus of the Bible. And this is why that I preach the message titled Jesus of the Bible, and then the God of the Bible, uh, and then the er eternality of God's what I named it. And then I preach the message on pure religion and tradition. And so I did those uh, messages for a reason, uh, that we will have a good foundation as we consider this. And here's another a quote actually taken from the Yogi Journal. And it speaks of this. It says that con connecting the mind, body, and breath helps us to direct our attention inward. And through the, this process of inward attention, we learn to recognize our habitual thought patterns without labeling them, judging them, or trying to change them. We become more aware of our experiences from moment to moment. The awareness that we cultivate is what makes yoga a practice rather than a task or a goal to be completed. Your body will most likely become more uh, flexible by doing yoga and so will your mind. And again, yoga did not originally begin as physical exercise. It began, in a, and I'm going to show you that in just a moment, it began as a spiritual practice to be connected with the gods and the universe. Now, we're coming to Romans chapter 1. And I want you to notice with me in Romans chapter 1. And if we begin reading in verse 18, we find that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth 
in unrighteousness. And, he, and, and as we read through these passages, we see clearly uh, the issue of nature worship. In other words, we find here in verse 25, it said that they changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. So we find here in this passage that there, that the, there are those who worship and serve the creature more than the Creator. Why? Because this is what happens in verse 18 when men hold the truth in unrighteousness. We find the consequences in chapter 1 uh, of men holding the truth in unrighteousness. Now, here's another quote, and it says, in, Hindu, in the Hindu and Buddhist religion, yoga is described as the only way to escape the endless cycle of reincarnation and the laws of karma thereby enabling someone to reach the Hindu heaven. That is spelled M-O-S-K-H-A. Now, I want you to think about this. And this is where I really want to focus in on, not spend a lot of time, but put great emphasis on this. The physical postures and the breathing techniques and the meditation, they were all originally designed and developed for very spiritual and religious reasons. I want you to just think about that. And the quote I just gave you, in the Hindu and Buddhist religion, yoga, yoga rather is described as the only way to escape the endless cycle of reincarnation and the laws of karma thereby enabling someone to reach the Hindu heaven. This is the origin of yoga. comes straight out of Hinduism. Now, when we talk about the postures, and I'm not going to get into all the details of them, but the postures or the poses, they are basically an offering to millions of Hindu gods. The breathing techniques... All of this is centered around not Jesus Christ, not the Bible, but it's centered around self and becoming in unity and harmony with the universe. Meditation is not the meditation we find in the Bible. The meditation in yoga and Hinduism is to empty our mind, clear our minds. We know that in the Scripture, meditation is to fill our minds, with the things of God, His Word, and so forth, and His works. Here's another quote. And by the way, going to the postures or poses, the breathing, the meditations, the chanting, the alms, the sound of the universe, the dancing, the laying on of hands, all of these things are involved in Hinduism and even yoga. But here's another quote. Yoga uh, uh, positions or poses helps to become one with the universe and with God, little g. They are designed to enhance the flow of energy called kundalina, the energy coiled like a serpent at the base of the spine and travels through seven points. Even the sun uh, salutation is the saluting of the sun. In other words, there are all the different poses and whatever. They are for a reason. Now, here's one other quote. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll wait on that. I'm going to read here again. I'm going to come back to verse 25. And I want you to notice here in verse 25. But keep in mind, the, the, the physical postures or poses, the breathing techniques, the meditations, the chanting, the alms, all of this is associated with with paganism, the occult, and Hinduism. So I want you to keep that in mind. Now, now I want you to notice, as we read in verse 25, again, he said, "...who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever." Amen. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 
12. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, and notice here. Now I want to give you another quote. And again, I don't like doing this, but we don't do this that often. Maybe four, five, six, seven sermons out of the year that we deal with something like this. Another quote is this. And um trying to think. Uh, yes. Uh, every pose in yoga is a position to a Hindu deity. Hinduism is based on pantheism. You know what pantheism is? That's nature worship which believes everything is a god and everybody is a god, including yourself, and yoga helps attain the oneness with the gods and brings you with uh, the self-awareness that you are a god. And when I spoke on Gnosticism last week, we seen some similar, similar language, but here we see, uh, let me come to this right here. Let's come back to the subject and I drew this little picture on the board up here. I hope you can see that. You've got it in your chart, but I've actually got some points uh, up the, the body of this man that's sitting in a pose here, and I'll explain that in just a moment. But there's there's a number. Uh, I think I'll wait on that right there. Let's, let's come to Deuteronomy 12 first of all, and, let, and I'll get to this Kundalini yoga in just a moment. Notice in Deuteronomy 12, and I want to read the first six verses from this chapter. And if you write down uh, Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 14, uh, you'll see clearly the pagan practices that was in the land of Canaan when the Jewish people, God's people, went in to possess that land. But notice now in verse 1, he says here, These are the statutes and judgments which you shall observe to do in the land, which the Lord God of thy fathers giveth thee to possess it all the days that ye live upon the land. You shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods, upon the high mountains, upon the hills, and under every green tree. And ye shall overthrow their altars, and break their pillars, and burn their groves, with fire, and you shall hew down of the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of their, out of that place, and you shall not do so unto the Lord your God. The reason I read this is I come into my second point, the danger of yoga. I read this in reference is that, is that we find that yoga is rooted Again, an Eastern religion and mysticism. It is a false religion. And the Lord gives to His people here in the book of Daniel, He said, don't you borrow the practices of these occult religions. In other words, this paganism, the Lord is saying, get rid of everything, get break down their groves and their high places and their idols, get all of this out of the land as you come in. And he said, because I want you, in verse 1, to keep my statutes and my judgments, he, I want you to observe my laws and my ordinances. This is what God is saying. Now, in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20, not asking you to turn there, I want you to turn to Exodus 20. But in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, of that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. In Proverbs 16.25, it says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That's repeated again in chapter 14 and verse 12. Then in Luke 16 and verse 15, he said that, that uh, that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. These are other verses that just give us warning. Well, notice in the book of Exodus, and I'm reading in chapter 20. I'm going to read the first uh, six verses here also. Now, when we talk about yoga, yoga appears in much of the sacred literature out of India. 
that's connected with Hinduism. And again, there's some of these uh, uh, books and whatever, I can't even pronounce the names, but one of their classic texts that they say was written in the 5th century, in chapter 6, here's the words. It says, Krishna declares, and I'm quoting, Thy joy supreme comes to the yogi who is one Brahman with God. And so we're talking about, again, yoga and the yogis. They're connected with this pagan religion. The origin of yoga, again, is shrouded, sort of like teaching on Gnosticism. There's such a variety and different avenues of it, but it's shrouded in mystery and mythology of Eastern mysticism and Eastern religions. And so uh, sometimes it's hard to just nail something out exactly, but when you put it all together, I mean, I, I mean you've got a false religion, and, and yoga is a part of that. Now, notice as we read here from our text in, in the book of uh, Exodus, and this has to do with the Ten Commandments. And notice the first few commandments here in this passage. He says in verse 1, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Now notice commandment number 1, Thou shalt have no other gods before thee. And then commandment number two, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Then we get into the uh, third commandment in verse 7. What we find in this passage is that God is speaking against idolatry. Idolatry is a sin and an insult to, to God's majesty. Idolatry is an abomination. And it places the creation above the Creator, as we just read in Romans chapter 1. And so we're not to bow before idols, nor set up idols even in our hearts, according to Ezekiel chapter 14. And one writer said, according to this text, he says, Durham was his name, he said, We are no more at liberty to worship the true God in a false way, then we are to worship false gods. So he sums up these two commandments. Hinduism has millions of gods. I don't know how many. I've read where they have 330 million gods. It's amazing, isn't it? But the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 6, there is one true and living God, the God of the Bible. But they have millions of gods. And again, we're talking about occultism, paganism, pantheism. We, all of these things fit when we come to the subject of Hinduism or yoga. Now, I, I read an article this past week, and I've been looking at this now for three weeks, and I have touched on this years ago and uh, 20 years ago, I spent a few moments on it in a sermon, but I thought we'll preach one entire sermon. But this article says that every yoga teacher in America is a Hindu or Buddhist missionary, even if they wear a cross and speak of Jesus Christ. And I agree with that. There is no such thing as Christian yoga. Many ministries out there, many, and I promise you when you dive into that and really look at it, you're going to find that they do not believe the Jesus Christ that you and I believe in the Scripture. Now, there, there's about eight different forms of yoga. There's karma yoga, kundalini yoga, tantra. Um, there, there's, there's about eight different forms of yoga. Karma yoga, 
uh, connects with each person in the universe. Kundalini Yoga is to awaken the level of consciousness. And I want to read just a few more uh, quotes uh, before that before that we move on. And I want to take a, and this is a glomeration of quotes, but this has to do with Kundalini Yoga, which is salvation through serpent power. And this is why I drew this little image of, up here on the board. And you have one in your hand. You just don't have uh, the different points in this. But I, w- I want you to listen to this. Kundalini Yoga is a form of yoga that is called the serpent. It is the awakening of a powerful form of psychic energy that we were born with, which is at the base of the spine. You notice here, I've got, starting down here, different points and goes up to the crown of the head. Okay, There's a total of seven of those, if you count the crown and the third eye. I'm going to read on. This kundalini awakening is through such things as yoga. I'm quoting from the experts, the masters, the gurus, the yogis. I'm not on the street or going into some gym and some compromised church and asking some silly Christian, you know, what do you think of yoga? That's not who I'm talking to. That's not who I am, am, am looking at. But you go and ask the experts if you know if you, know, if you want to know what they believe. If somebody wants to know what Victory Baptist Church believes, you come and ask us and we'll tell you. We'll tell you exactly what we believe. But it said this kundalini awakening is through such things as yoga, chanting, meditation, dancing, and laying on of hands. Here's an exact quote. Hindu psychology teaches the kundalini, or serpent power, snake worship, by the way, lies at the base of the spine. You can see where I started that there. You can put you some little dots there if you want to. And, and, and it says, normally the kundalini lies dormant in most human beings, but when it is awakened, it arises and begins to travel upwards. Now, I have a picture of two snakes, two serpents. There's a male and the female. And it says, in its journey from the base of the spine to the top of the head, it passes through six psychic centers called, uh, called rather, uh, chatras. That's what these are called, points or chatras. And it goes on to say, when it passes through a chatra, that's like moving from this chatra at the space of the vine, vine at the base of the spine, I've got that backward, at the base of the spine and comes up and one of these is the heart, one's up here at the throat, and one is the third eye, and then all the way to the top of the crown. So this quote says that when it passes through a chantra, it kindles various psychic experience and energies, and when it reaches the crown, one attains power to perform miracles and to even achieve liberation. When we would speak of liberation, it's through the blood of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. When they speak of liberation, it's through things like yoga, uh, 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 through these chantras, rather, kundalini, uh, uh, yoga, and whatever. And so they're talking about liberation through this long Process, But what is really interesting in this is that these are different levels of consciousness. Self-realization happens with Kundalini. Another quote says, This enlightenment starts to rise from the bottom of the spinal cord to the third eye, open the door to light, the beginning of super-consciousness or illumination. And now listen to this. I'm, I'm going to carry you into the third eye, and I'll just put aside the... Uh, We'll not worry about the uh, uh, the karma uh, yoga. I've got some very good quotes on that as well. We'll not worry about that right now. But uh, we'll continue on with this kundalini yoga. And, he, and it says here, when you have a kundalini experience, you can see the cosmos, heaven, universe, 
and so forth. It says the awakening of the inner kundalini is the true beginning of the spiritual journey. Another quote, it says, it is said to create sensation of heat and cold, tingling, electric current, internal pressures, uh, inner sound and lights, buzzing in the ear. Well, you can get that from smoking marijuana, by the way. And compulsion, body movements and expressions, uncontrollable emotion outbursts, loss of memory, a sense of inner eye. Who would want all of that to begin with? But here's what I'm getting at when we talk about kundalini yoga is that, is that we're talking about this process starting through meditation and chanting and exercise and posture. And when you see them sitting in this particular posture, the spine and the back and everything has to be straight for this process to work. There's a reason for all of this, but the whole point is the opening of the third eye, which is right here. Not a physical eye, but uh, what they would call a spiritual eye. And they say this, if certain energies in you reach a certain peak in you, you have a new clarity, vision of life, to see things from a completely different perspective. In other words, seeing beyond, seeing life beyond normal, limitations, to reach a point where life cannot disturb you. And how many have you ever seen in Hinduism the red dot between, or not between the eyes, but above the, the eyes and the forehead? That is to represent the third eye, the spiritual eye whereby you can see things that no one else can see. It represents, again, the third eye of spiritual sight, which sees things the physical eye cannot see. And so we're talking about serpent worship. We're talking about pantheism. We're talking about paganism, the occult. When we talk about Hinduism and the many millions of gods, and when we talk about yoga. And I don't care if somebody says, well, I only do it for the exercise. You're still doing poses that honor Pagan deities. You see, that's the thing I want to get across. And again, maybe some other, well, maybe I won't either. I don't want to fool with this again. Uh, but, uh, but I, I'm just simply saying to you, this is pagan and it is very wicked. Even in transcendental med- meditation has a connection with all of this. Karma yoga I have many uh, quotes and whatever. I do want to deal with this just for a moment. I want you to listen to this in karma yoga. The path of self-action. In karma yoga, one sees to the end the eternal cycle of death and rebirth. I want to come back to this thing about reincarnation just for a moment. Why would somebody go through all this process all of their life? Our salvation is in Christ. I was born again in a moment of time. In 1972, it wasn't a process to have eternal life. In Hinduism, uh, we find that this process... Let me just read here so I don't run out of time. Listen to this. Dealing with karma yoga. Okay, I'm going to give you a definition for karma, reincarnation, but karma yoga. Here's an exact quote from a yogi. It says, Yoga was especially designed as a way to escape the constant and never-ending deaths and rebirths of reincarnation. So this is designed, karma yoga is designed to try to get out of this vicious cycle of deaths and rebirths, this reincarnation. Another quote, according to the law of karma, each man has to take the consequences of his good and bad action. For this he has to be continually reborn into this world. Another quote, karma It demands equal payment. In other words, illustration like a black eye for a black eye. You got bad karma, you got to pay for it. And it it says an individual uh, uh, present life is determined by the law of karma, his actions, his words, his thoughts in the previous lifetimes. The teaching of karma is to, is the debt of one's bad action must be atoned for, for 
through various Hindu practices in order for one to escape the cycle of reincarnation. The ultimate goal in karma, yoga, is to escape this cycle of rebirth and unite with God. Well, we reunite with God through Jesus Christ, through the God of the Bible. Another quote, the eternal soul of man is trapped in the physical body. Repeated lies or reincarnation are required before the soul can be liberated from the body. You hear a lot now people talk about karma and this, that, and the other. Well, karma is a Hindu uh, doctrine connected with a yoga. And let me, let me give you another quote here. Reincarnation. The transmigration of the soul from one body to another, humans, plants, animals. And that's the reason you don't kill cows in India, because it might be your grandmother, you see. And here's one other quote on reincarnation. And it says, reincarnation is designed to help work off bad karma. Now think about this. Reincarnation is designed to work off bad karma can be upwards or downwards, meaning I could be reborn as an animal or even a vegetable to give countless changes to reach heaven. And that's what yoga is all about. There's different forms of yogas. But this is one aspect of yoga. Uh, Kundalini yoga is to uh, bring a person to this state of altered consciousness and this state of the third eye being open and him being or her being crowned, that they are one, their spirit is one with the spirit of the universe. In other words, they would attain the place where they would not have to die again and be reborn and die and re be reborn. That's what this garbage is all about. Turn with me, please, to... Uh, to uh, Second Corinthians. Notice with me in Second Corinthians, chapter ten. Second Corinthians, chapter ten. <clears throat> and I'm going to give you a few other verses. I want you to write down. I'm afraid I'm going to run out of time. But in First Corinthians ten, now I told you to turn to Second Corinthians. But in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 20 and 22, God clearly tells you and I as Christians that we cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils, and we cannot partake of the Lord's table and also the table of devils. That's 1 Corinthians 10, verse 20 and 21. Now, Christianity and yoga are not compatible with one another. There's no place for any form or type of yoga in the Christian life. You just heard me read a quote whereby that not only do they teach the yogis, uh, the masters, the gurus, not only do they teach that, that this is going to stretch your body and form your body, but it's going to change your mind. It's going to change your thinking uh, process. Even Rob Bell, a preacher, a sermon, 29th of, Sep 29th of May, rather, 2005, titled The Theology of Breathing. Here's what he said. He says, something divine about our breath. Breath deeply no, let me back up. Breathe deeply to invite the God of the universe into your breath. I wonder sometimes when we feel as though God is so far, God is thinking, I gave you breathing, I can't get closer. Is God as close as breathing? You see how this is affecting even people in Christian circles? Well, coming to our third point now, the Christian and yoga. We've looked at the meaning briefly, and I could give you another hundred quotes from the authorities in yoga. Uh, we've looked at the danger. This will lead you away from the true and living God. 
And now we'll look at Christian, the Christian and yoga. Notice with me as we come to 2 Corinthians. I'm going to read here in just a moment. But write down 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 through 15. Satan appears as an angel of light. In verse 1, 2, and 3 of that chapter, there's another Jesus, there's another gospel, and there's another spirit the Apostle Paul spoke about. Write down also 2 Corinthians 6. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through chapter 7, verse 1, where he tells us to come out and be separate. He said, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. He speaks of our temple, uh, that uh, you're the temple of the living God. He said in verse 17, Come out from among them and be ye separate, and touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you. He says, I'll be a father unto you, and you shall be sons and daughters, saith the Lord. And he says in chapter 7 in verse 1, that we are to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now notice as we come to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. So what am I saying? I'm saying that yoga did not originate in the church of Jesus Christ. Christian yoga is an oxymoron. It is a tool of the devil. It is not compatible with uh, Christianity. Yoga is Satan worship. It's a satanic worship. When we look at Christianity and yoga, they both have a very different concept of God. They both have a very different concept of humanity or man, and they both have a very different concept of how a person is saved. The yoga philosophy cannot be separated from the yoga practices. It cannot be done. Physical yoga, as one man said, is connected to Eastern religions. The postures, the breathing exercises are much more than just another form of physical exercise. So this is when when we hear people talk about this, we need to let them know that this is paganism. It is the occult. It is contrary to to biblical Christianity and theology. Now notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I want to read verse 3, 4, and 5. And let's talk about meditation just for a moment. Christian meditation is not alms and emptying of the mind and trying to come to a place of an altered consciousness. But Christian meditation is the filling of the mind of the Word of God and the things of God and the works of God. Notice he says here in this passage, verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imagination and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Where do you see emptying the mind there? He says we're to bring every thought into the obedience of Christ, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We're not to let our minds be emptied and and come into an altered uh, state of mind. I'll tell you what will happen. The devil will fill that mind when it gets empty with the things that should not be in there. All through the Scriptures. In Joshua 1 and verse 8, he said, Meditate day and night upon the book of the law if you want to be successful or be prosperous. He said in Psalms 1 and verse 2, Delight and meditate in the law of the Lord again day and night. 
In Psalms 143, verse 5, he said, Meditate on all God's works. Not only His Word, but His works. I mean, I mean, think about uh, when uh, God carried the children of Israel through the Red Sea and all those kind of things. We're to be thinking on the things of God. We're to be thinking on the works of God. The Word of God. What He's accomplished in the past. What He will do in the future. When we look at Eastern uh, religions and yoga and all of this, it is used to reach a higher form of consciousness and to discover the inter, uh, the inner deity or divinity. And that's what it's all about. Connecting the inner divinity with the divinity of the universe. But when we come to the Scriptures, we find that meditation, biblical meditation, brings comfort and joy and happiness and peace and it brings soundness of mind. Well, notice with me as we come to 1 Timothy chapter uh, 2. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, and notice here. So we see that we are to separate ourselves from anything that's contrary to Scripture. We are only to meditate upon the things of God. Psalms 119 in verse 15, 23, 48, 78, 97, 99, and 148, I have all of these in an article on meditation. We find all these that we're to meditate upon the Word of God. David said he delighted in meditating upon the things of God. He wasn't sitting out with his legs crossed and his fingers together, you know, and trying to empty his mind. David was trying to fill his mind with the things of God that he might be obedient and follow the true and living God. Well, notice in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and I'm going to be pick a reading up in verse 8. Notice what I'm in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8. What about modesty? I'm going to tell you this right now. There is nothing modest about yoga pants, whether it be on a man or on a woman. Now, about 80% of the practitioners are women. And I can definitely understand that. But you do have a small percentage that are men. And think about why some of these men probably get involved in the yoga classes. Because the Bible tells us very clearly that a man is sexually stimulated by looking. That's why he says, look, look not or lust not upon a woman. Lust not in the hearts. Don't be looking upon a woman. You know. And uh, so, if you went into a gymnasium where they're practicing yoga, half naked and in these yoga pants and whatever, it shows every form and every curve of a woman's body. And so, I think I know why some of the men are there. Probably much more than just exercise. But notice, as we come here and read this, beginning in verse 8, he said, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness, and sobriety, not with broaded hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. This is not the only place. He even tells us in chapter 5 and verse 2 of this book how a man is to look upon a woman. And, and he's to look upon them with purity. Well, that'd be very difficult to do in a yoga class, in a yoga setting. And the thing about it is there is a lot of flesh that is revealed in these yoga gyms and places, whatever they call them, when they, when they meet and, and, uh, and do their exercises. A lot of flesh. And even if there's no flesh that is revealed, the form and contour of a woman's body is clearly seen. As a matter of fact, the yoga pants is not much different than just wearing a pair of pantyhose. Not much different. And so, you know, it's sort of like, it's sort of like I've said to you over the years, over the 20 plus years, you can get out here in public 
with your underwear on and they arrest you. But you can take that same underwear and paint polka dots and stripes on it and walk on the beach or go anywhere you want to and it's okay. We have a, we have a funny way of understanding things. You know, in our society. And I'm simply saying to you is that, is that when we talk about modesty, there is nothing modest. Nothing modest about yoga pants. I want to give you a couple of quotes. And I have to remind ourselves of this sometimes because it's so easy to forget it even in our society. When it comes to the subject of even cross-dressing to begin with, Deuteronomy 22, 5, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. But we here, listen to this. Tight pants were designed by Calvin Klein, a bisexual fashion designer, when his super tight pants appeared in 1978. They sold 200,000 pairs in the first week. Another quote. This is, uh, it says that to tights, talking about yoga pants now, tights worn as pants were designed and, and by a homosexual fashion designer who was murdered by another homosexual in 1997. And what I'm getting at is that tight clinging attire is immodest as skimpy attire. In other words, when it's tight and clinging to the to the flesh, that's just, just about as immodest as not having anything on at all. Because it's showing the form of the body. And the clothing industry know this. And the sodomites know this. So we find here that the women in like manner also, verse 9, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel and with shame, faintness, faceness, and sobriety. In other words, there is to be modest, modesty in the Christian life. And so the world is going to do what they want to do with it, but what about you and I that are Christians? Well, even if it wasn't pagan and occultic and satanic, this would be another reason to leave it alone. Turn to one last passage. Matthew 11, we'll close here. Matthew chapter 11. You notice I just stuck a lot of stuff aside because we're never going to get to it. Our time is running short. We are to abstain from all appearances of evil. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 Jeremiah 10, 2, We're not to learn uh, the ways of the heathen. We're not to practice them. Second John 9, we are to abide in the doctrine of Christ. So I leave with you this morning as we bring this uh, to a close, is that yoga is not only an immodest position that anyone would put themselves in, but it is satanic. It is very satanic. They deny the Jesus Christ that you believe in and the God that you believe in. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. They, they deny that. Now notice carefully as we turn to Matthew 11, and we're going to close. And it says here in Matthew chapter 11, in verse 28, 29, and 30, Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The reason I wanted to close with this, we are to take the yoke of Christ upon us. Not the yoke with uh, the universe or some Hindu god. But we're to take the yoke of Christ, and when we put the yoke of Christ on, we're not spending a lifetime going through cycles and going through processes to be saved. But when we take the yoke of Christ, he says here in this passage, notice this, 
He says in verse 29, the last part of that, he said, and you shall find rest for your soul. When we yoke up with Christ, we have salvation and peace and eternal life and we have rest for our soul. And we don't have to worry about coming back as a cow or a monkey or a potato plant. We don't have to worry about that. We know that when we die, there is a resurrection that's promised unto us. Uh, and and we, have, we will receive a new glorified body that will live eternally with the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me this morning? I know that this has nothing to do with anybody in this church. And the sermon I preached last week has nothing to do. Nobody's practicing in this church Gnosticism or yoga unless you're doing it in secret. But we have families and friends and relatives and co-workers and whatever that are involved in this. And I'm hearing more and more Christians. Think about one out of every ten persons in America is probably practicing yoga. If 30 million and we have 330 million people, wouldn't that, wouldn't that be about one out of ten or one out of eleven? Father, we thank Thee for this day, for this time that You've given us together. Lord, we thank You for Your Word that keeps us from these other things. The freedom in Christ that frees us from paganism, frees us from all of these things that come our way. And Lord, we now ask for Your blessings upon the remainder of the service. Bless us, Lord, as we sing, as we close in prayer this morning. We just pray Thy will to be done in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.